great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, this research paper has been more than a year in the making, and I'm so proud that today we finally published the full report. Um, and a big thanks to Sarah Stonbley, who will be on stage in just a moment, to present her findings. Also, I want to thank Heather Bryant, who helped edit the report and designed it, went through many iterations with us. And I also want to thank everyone who was gracious enough to give Sarah time uh, so she could interview you for the paper. Your stories are really what um, made this successful and helped us to identify six different models of collaboration. This is the um, fourth thing that the center has done based around collaborative journalism, and we hope it's the beginning of many more to come. Um, last year, you know, several of you were at our collaborative journalism summit. After that, we were fortunate to give out $42,000 in grants to seven different, um, six rather, different uh, reporting projects across the country. We've recently launched collaborativejournalism.org, which we hope will be a hub of resources, case studies. And now today we are releasing our full paper on comparing different models of collaborative journalism. So um, with that being said, I would like to welcome the author of the report to the stage, Sarah Stambly. Stephanie, and thanks for everyone uh, for being here. Um, on behalf of the Center for Cooperative Media, as well as the School of Communication and uh, Media here at Montclair State, I welcome you and I thank you for your interest in this important topic. Um, as Stephanie uh, alluded, this research began with um, the germ of an idea, and it was really Stephanie who sensed a lot of interest in collaborative journalism sort of out there in the field. Um, and we decided to organize the summit on collective journalism um, and as we were planning, Stephanie's instincts were confirmed. Um, the Collaborative Journalism Summit last May, which some of you attended, was successful beyond our expectations. Uh, there was a lot of excitement and positivity, and more than one person noted that it was nice to attend a journalism conference uh, that was more success stories than doom and gloom. Sorry, one second. Um, at that conference, I presented our initial matrix of different models um, of collaborative journalism, journalism, and I was really glad and not a little bit relieved that they held up uh, when applied to the many different examples of collaborative journalism that we discussed at the summit. Um, what followed, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, was several months of intensive research, including interviews, reading, uh, analysis, and discussion, um, which has finally culminated in the report that we are here to discuss. Um, before getting into the models in the matrix, I'd just like, uh, like to talk briefly about sort of the big picture context of collaborative journalism. Um, of course, it is not new. Um, in fact, it dates all the way back to the 19th century and the advent of the wires. Um, the Associated Press was, in fact, one of the very earliest collaborative efforts. Um, the joint operating agreements that many newspapers had in the 1970s and 80s was, uh, were also collaborations. And that sort of back office arrangement is highlighted in one of the models that I'll discuss shortly. Uh, in the 1990s, organizations such as New America Media were partnering ethnic outlets with legacy outlets to share expertise and resources. And in the early 2000s, Jan Schaefer's JLab was forward thinking when they worked with uh, Knight Foundation to foster a number of collaborations some of which continue today. And of course, Josh Stern's Now a Democracy Fund has been talking up collaborative journalism for years. Uh, so it's not new. But what is new is the depth and the breadth of journalistic collaboration and the popularity the practice has gained and the critical mass that's being achieved. Um, for example, one statistic that I highlight in the report is that as of 2017, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has put nearly $32 million into fostering 29 collaborative journalism projects. And that number is still growing. So how do we find collaborative journalism? Collaborative journalism in the report is defined as a cooperative arrangement between two, uh, it can be formal or informal, between two or more news and information organizations, which aim to supplement each organization's resources and maximize the impact of the content produced. Um, we distinguish collaborative journalism here from citizen, participatory, engaged, public, 
um, and other types of journalism that solicit information from the public or consider interaction with the public to be a cornerstone practice. So many collaborations do indeed have an engage element, uh, engagement element. Um, we also situate collaborative journalism, at least the type we're discussing here, um, squarely in and between newsrooms. Although we do plan to explore collaborations between newsrooms and other types of organizations, such as tech and civic organizations in the future. So we've identified two of what we think are the most important variables of collaborative uh, journalism models, and those are duration and degree of integration among partner organizations. And then you can see here that as both increase, the level of commitment required also increases. The matrix, which I know is very small here, and you can see it in more detail or clo more closely on page 21 of the report, um, shows these same variables. Uh, so you have a duration on the horizontal axis in the one time and finite projects and then the ongoing or open-ended projects. And then you have level of integration on the uh, vertical axis. So starting with uh, creating content separately and sharing it, working together to create content, and then finally at the highest level of integration, um, organizations uh, are integrated at the level of the organization. So they're sharing data and resources uh, at that level. Um, this results in six models of collaborative journalism, which I'll discuss briefly. So temporary and separate, temporary and co-creating, temporary and integrated, and then ongoing and separate, ongoing and co-creating, ongoing and integrated. And I will just note that the number of examples here is somewhat arbitrary, although we do try to reflect sort of the more, more common and uh, less common uh, models as they're practiced um, in the field. So let me just discuss uh, each really briefly, and there's much more detail in the report, um, as you'll see. The temporary and separate model features collaborations where partners work together on a one-time or finite project and they're creating content separately. So the content may be aggregated for presentation in one place, such as the um, program's website, or a, they may be presented across uh, different platforms, on partners' platforms or across media. Um, some projects that fall under this model use a sort of decentralized, very laissez-faire approach to uh, coordination and content creation, while others have specific guidelines for what should be produced by participating organizations. Um, the projects where those decisions are not made in advance, one way or the other, do tend to run into trouble. Um, a common benefit of these types of projects is that um, when, especially when organizations of different sizes partner together, um, smaller news organizations or contributors gain much greater visi visibility than they would have had otherwise. Um, also, when collaborations in this model are around specific issues, such as a local river or homelessness, as two of the examples we looked at, they are able to leverage contributor and community passions around these issues. Um, one common cost or tension of this model can be quality control, um, because the, it's very sort of um, atomized across organizations. Um, so we looked at some great examples in the temporary and separate model, including One River, Many Stories, led by the University of Minnesota Duluth, the San Francisco Homeless Project, and New America Media's Surging Seas, all of which you can read more about in the report. Um, the next is the temporary and co-creating model. So this model features finite collaborations where partners create content together. Um, these are necessarily closer and more coordinated projects um, than those in which pr uh, participants produce content separately. Um, and they therefore require more resources, at least during some stages. Um, when partners work together to create content, of course there's the potential for conflicting priorities at different newsrooms, um, but this tension can be mitigated in different ways, including by general excitement about the topic, by good project management, or by a high level of rapport between the partners. Um, examples in this model tend to be investigative or accountability pieces, which was an interesting finding, I thought. Um, so the examples we looked at include Election Land, American Dream about the mall formerly known as Xanadu here in New Jersey, uh, and Voting Block also here in New Jersey. Um, so all of these graphics as well as the matrix are also available in the report as well. Um, temporary and integrated projects are those projects that are finite but uh, where the partnering organizations are sharing resources at the level of the organization. Um, so when they share this kind of, when they, when they have this level of integration, there's obviously 
going to be uh, close coordination and regular contact for the duration of the project. Um, perhaps the best example of this type of collaboration to date is the Panama Papers, um, where participating organizations all had access to the same data and proprietary software. Um, they were working together to sort through it, but writing different stories that were unique to the outlet produce, that produced them and publishing on many different things. Um, when organizations are highly integrated for a collaboration, it generally requires buy-in from all levels. And, um, but the payoff is great. Right, working together in this way allows newsrooms to produce content they would never have been able to produce on their own. Uh, both the temporary and integrated and the ongoing and integrated, which I'll discuss in a moment, are the least common types of collaboration, uh, perhaps because they require an intimate relationship among outlets that are normally competitive. Other, out, uh, other examples that we looked at include first draft uh, cross-checks, um, a collaboration between ProPublica, WBEZ's Chicago's This American Life, and NPR's Planet Money on a hedge fund called Magnetar, uh, which and its practices in the early 2000s. So again, just not a ton of examples of this type of model out there uh, yet. So moving on now to the ongoing collaborations. Um, the ongoing and separate model is where, uh, is an open-ended collaboration where organizations work together to create content. I'm sorry, work, create content separately. Um, and this includes some of the oldest known collaborations, the wires that I mentioned earlier, um, as well as some of the contemporary sharing, sharing arrangements, such as uh, Gannett's USA Today Network and CNN also fall into this model. Smaller news organizations are using it too, though. Um, the common thread in these projects is that organizations uh, reap the benefits of content sharing while maintaining a high level of autonomy and editorial independence. Um, a local, ongoing, and separate collaboration that we looked at in the report um, is between Charlottesville Tomorrow and the Daily Progress, both in Charlottesville, Virginia. And here, um, the Charlottesville Tomorrow began as a newsletter focused on education issues, and the Daily Progress is the area's uh, legacy print newspaper. The Progress uh, began to print some of uh, Char Charlottesville Tomorrow's education stories when the newsroom was downsized, and now Hundreds of stories later, uh, they're still involved in a collaboration that's been mutually beneficial. Um, for Charlottesville tomorrow, so it's obvious that the Daily Progress gets uh, content that they would have never had. For Charlottesville tomorrow, um, it gives them a seal of credibility um, being printed in the Daily Progress. Um, perhaps surprisingly, I was surprised, uh, many of these collaborations begin informally and without a contract and are codified uh, as they mature. By our estimation, this type of collaboration, ongoing and separate, is the most commonly practiced today, uh, both in terms of the number of organizations involved and the geographic area reached by such projects. Um, other examples in the report include Fronteras and Cal Matters. Uh, the next model, ongoing and co-creating. So again, ongoing project, um, co-creating means they're producing the content together. Um, usually, these types of collaborations have regular editorial meetings or calls, um, and the most successful in this model have a project manager who oversees the collaboration and facilitates sharing and manages competing priorities. Um, collaborations in this model see benefits such as efficiencies created by letting one reporter cover a press conference where all of the partners may have been sending a reporter now just one reporter goes and reports back to the whole um, collaboration. Or centralizing editing tasks um, that newsrooms may have been doing individually. Um, this model also allows reporters to gain insights from other geographical locations or topic areas that they wouldn't have had access to working alone, as in NPR's uh, collaborative coverage project, with which Bruce Oster will speak about more in a moment. Um, while we were researching collaborations in this model, we found several that began with a grant, usually from Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Um, and then they decided to continue after the grant ended by self-funding. Uh, they agreed upon an amount that each partner would pay, and that went toward paying for the collaboration manager and for other resources. And we state in the report that this is a promising path forward um, for collaborations that begin with an initial grant and want to continue after. Um, so the final model is ongoing and integrated, um, which again, ongoing collaboration 
where organizations are sharing resources at the level of the organization. Um, this model is not yet very common, but we do see it as a really innovative way of addressing some of the challenges of the local media landscape. Um, the few examples uh, that we looked at in the report are similar in structure. Uh, they are made up of local outlets that operate independently, but com are completely integrated for some aspects of their back office services. So this means uh, that editorial hiring and promotion uh, decisions are made completely independently, um, but that they share an ad network, a proprietary platform, or accounting services, or sometimes all three. Um, so the examples we look at in the report are the Tap Into Network of digital native local sites here in New Jersey, and Coast Alaska, um, which is a collaboration between seven public radio stations in Southeast Alaska. Uh, collaborations using this model find that sharing back office services creates efficiencies and allows them to hire professionals to do this work, which are usually not the strong suit of journalists. Um, they also gain some of the benefits of being part of a collaborative, such as working together on big stories or learning by observing um, each other's workflows. Um, one cautionary note, uh, ongoing and integrated collaborations are not for the faint of heart. Um, you have to be willing to cede control of major aspects of the operation, um, but those who have taken the plunge do find that the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, so while these six models did well <laughs> for categorizing all of the collaborative projects we discuss, um, there were some projects that blurred the lines or changed models as the project progressed, thus our little friend the chameleon up here. Um, so, for example, the Harvest collaboration um, between several public outlets across the Midwest um, is categorized as ongoing and co-creating, um, but it shades into ongoing and integrated because they share um, several resources at the organizational level. Um, so where that happens in the report, we note that. Um, likewise, the Detroit Journalism Cooperative began as temporary and separate, um, but since morphed into an ongoing and co-creating model. So despite these examples, we do think that the matrix will be useful, we hope, um, to journalists, editors, scholars, and funders alike who want to know what they may be getting into if they're considering a collaboration um, or when they're considering funding a collaboration. Um, we've distilled a lot of this information and put it on the website we've created to house the white paper and a lot of other materials, so I invite you to check it out. Um, and with that, I will introduce our panel, who will discuss, sort of take these uh, concepts and ideas and bring them into the real world and into real life with the collaborations that they all work on. Um, so our moderator will be the center's director, Stephanie Murray. Uh, I would like to invite up Bruce Oster, who is the senior director of NPR's Collaborative Journalism Network um, from 2008 to 2015. Bruce was NPR's senior security editor, where he directed NPR's coverage of international security issues from Washington. Um, for five years before that, he was the supervising, senior supervising editor of NPR's Morning Edition. In that role, he defined the editorial agenda for the show, identifying subject stories Morning Edition should be covering, and then helping bring those stories to the air. So we can all tell him how much we love Morning Edition later when we talk to him after the, <laughs> after the panel. Uh, before joining NPR, Oster spent 16 years as reporter and editor at U.S. News & World Report. Uh, there, among other things, he was the magazine's Pentagon correspondent for five years, covering stories from the first Gulf War to the early years of the Clinton administration. Jean Friedman Rodofsky is the project editor of Solution Journalism Network's reentry project in Philadelphia. From 2006 to 2013, Jean lived in La Paz, where she was a reporter for Time magazine. She's also a contributing editor to Vice magazine, and her writing has been published in the New York Times, Cosmopolitan, Science, Vice, Foreign Policy, Village Voice Media, Marie Claire, and The Telegraph Saturday M Magazine, among others. She covers topics related to social justice and reports on the lives of people and communities whose voices are underrepresented in mainstream media. She is also in the process of writing a book titled Distru Disruptors, Women's Resistance to Injustice from Across the Globe. And we have Erica Anderson, a Partnerships Manager, manager at Google News Lab. Uh, there, she's worked on projects such as Journalism 360, in which she built a global network of immersive journalists. Um, she has also trained hundreds of editors to fly drones via Pointer's drone journalism camps, 
and she regularly leads industry conversations on topics such as AI in the newsroom and trust in media. Before Google, Erica was uh, headed news partnerships for Twitter. Um, as the company's first news industry hire, she spearheaded its nascent journalism efforts, creating projects such as Twitter for newsrooms, satellite long codes so journalists could tweet from war zones, and identifying the data miner for news initiatives. Uh, prior to Twitter, Erica had the opportunity to work for Katie Couric at CBS Evening News, supporting Katie's instincts that social would be big, <laughs> providing her with support to lean into the new medium, integrating Twitter on the broadcast, utilizing blogs for interview research, and much more. And we are so pleased to welcome all of them here today. Let's take my picture off. <laughs> there we go. Where would you like to sit? Yeah, I'll start. I'll sit down here. My mic works, it appears. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for making the trip here from Washington and Philadelphia and New York City. It's wonderful to have you in our beautiful new building here on the campus of Montclair State University. Um, and Sarah, your presentation was great. Thank, thank you, you for all the work that you've done in this. And so I want to start with um, Bruce and then go to Jean and Erica. <coughs> Uh, before we get into some questions, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how you approach collaboration in your work and why it's important to you. Sure, happy to do it and, and glad to see people out here who are interested in in figuring out ways that journalists can work together because that's that's really what this is about and in the end it's about figuring out how we tell better stories and keep people informed. Um, you know, what I'm doing now is, a, is an offshoot of, of what I've done my whole career. I started as a news magazine writer where, uh, as an early journalist, as a young journalist coming up, I was always the tagline at the end of a story. Some big shot would write the story, but they would, they would get files from people like me who would contribute. And so, so working as a team was something that I started my career with. So when you get to a place like NPR, where there's only one person's voice on the radio, you're working against a, a, a slightly different culture. I mean, the, the person who is the re lead reporter is the star. And so I worked at Morning Edition, and I worked you know, with the hosts, Steve Inskeep, Renee Montaigne, I was the editor, and, and that is a certain kind of culture. Well, collaboration expands, and it, 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 it exists as a, as a challenge, even with, within an organization like NPR. And, and, and I've, as I moved across the organization, you're always looking for ways to get different people on different beats at different parts of the organization to learn how to work with each other and to, and to share information. So now what we're trying to do is take it another step. Um, I don't know all the stations that folks listen to who are here, who are, who are listening or are paying attention to this panel, but we have 200 newsrooms across the country. And, and we have this notion that wouldn't it be great if all those newsrooms knew what each other was thinking and doing. And so the task is to say, how can we become an even better network? How can we take the knowledge that exists in one part of our system and make sure it's shared with people in the other parts of the system so that we tell better stories for the audience? And that's what we're working on now. That's such a great point, knowing what all the other newsrooms are working on. That's been a, that's been a key challenge for a lot of large news organizations. Um, Jean. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So I, my name is Jean friedman Rudofsky, and I'm the project editor of the Reentry Project, um, which is one of the sort of case studies that Sarah looks at in her report. Um, and what we are is we are a group of 15 newsrooms in Philadelphia, um, including, you know, sort of the big guys in the area, WHYY, uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, Daily News, Philly.com and a variety of new and community and ethnic media in the city. Um, and we have come together. We started at the end of last year um, and are going through this year and now going into the next year, looking at um, the issue of prisoner reentry from a solutions-oriented perspective. Um, so this project um, was kind of conceived of when I was working with the Solutions Journalism Network, which some of you may know is uh, an organization dedicated to sort of fostering and facilitating the ability of journalists to do 
critical uh, reporting on responses to social problems rather than just the problems themselves. So um, we're a group of 15 newsrooms that do, you know, dedicated reporting on reentry um, over the course of the year and a lot of community engagement on the issue. Um, and so, you know, we are, I would say, in, in the scheme that Sarah put up, we're temporary and, and separate, although there is some co-creation that happens, um, both in terms of there's, you know, been joint reporting, cross-newsroom reporting uh, that's going on, and we have sort of a collective pot of money um, that each, any partner can apply to use for anything kind of related to the project, and then everyone else in the group decides whether they should get that allotment or not. And I actually don't have a vote. I facilitate those funding calls, but it's all, you know, essentially their competitors deciding whether they should get these resources. Um, so it's been a really fun project. Uh, we, it comes from a grant from the Knight Foundation, and we actually recently, just last week, got a grant from the Lenfest Institute, which is a new institute in Philadelphia dedicated to improving local journalism in Philly and around the country. Uh, and so we will be moving into 2018. And the exciting thing about that is sort of the, the vision that we put forward in our grant proposal was moving this in some ways to become, you know, an ongoing co-creating, even though we didn't use these words, ongoing co-creating space of essentially establishing a permanent independent hub for solutions-oriented collaborative reporting in Philadelphia um, that, you know, is open to any newsroom in the area. Um, and our, you know, next topic of focus is still to be determined. Um, so we're, in terms of fundraising, sort of part of the way there with the Lenfest grant to pursue that bigger vision. We certainly need a little bit more, but that's the direction that we're heading. Right. And Solutions Journalism Network has been a big, great partner of ours in New Jersey as has the Google News Lab. So Erica, tell us a little bit about your view. Yeah, well, it's good to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I come to this from the perspective of, I work at the Google News Lab. Um, Google News Lab started two years ago um, as Google's effort to build the future of journalism. Um, so that's a big, ambitious <laughs> effort. And we certainly couldn't do that alone. But we're a lot of people, about 15, 20 people inside the company who are former journalists who felt like we needed a dedicated effort to look at Google technology and resources and figure out how to apply that uh, to editorial and to help newsrooms around the world. So coming to the collaborative journalism space from that vantage point, a big thing that we look at is one of our biggest areas of focus is trust and verification. How can we help to build what is our role in facilitating and convening partners, bringing technology to the table to help improve um, fact checking, um, quelling misinformation, helping journalists to do their jobs more efficiently. And so through that vantage point, we've gotten very involved um, in First Draft Coalition and Partner Network, which we are a founding, proud founding member of uh, about two years ago. We um, were behind and collaborated with ProPublica and First Draft and Univision on election land. That was a really big project we were a part of. Documenting hate is another big um, kind of initiative that's going on right now that's looking at um, using Google data and information to track hate crimes. Um, across the United States so that journalists can have access to that. So we, um, I think generally like the future of journalism is going to be built right now as the constraints in the industry are occurring through collaborations like this and through coming up with new models, new workflows, new strategies. And as a tech company, like being at the table is critical for us um, to be learning alongside and getting ideas. And frankly, after these big projects end, coming back and talking to our engineers and our executives about what we've learned so that we can better understand the role that Google plays um, in terms of people finding quality journalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so Bruce, let's start with you a question. Sure. So uh, Sarah identified the collaborative coverage project as, right. um, in the report. And one of the things that she talked about, especially when you're looking at on ongoing and co-creating, that gets a little higher up the commitment level. Oh, we are so committed. <laughs> <laughs> so as the project manager and the editor, can you talk a little bit about what's required to keep a project like that running smoothly from the internal and external issues, workflow, et cetera. Sure, sure. And we talk a lot about how, you know, the whole role of an editor has changed. Um, you know, and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it an editor, a project manager. You know, there are a lot of labels for it. But in the end, you know, you're, you're basically trying to, to get a lot of different people who have different interests to work and pull in the same direction. And, and to define exactly what we're talking about here so you have some sense of this, 
Um, for any of you who listen to NPR, you, you will hear the, the sort of national or international correspondents. You will hear the hosts of the programs. But a lot of times what you also hear are reporters from out in the country. And, and the question sometimes for us is, is how do, what is our relationship? What is the relationship between headquarters and Washington? And those, I mean, there are literally 1,800 journalists who work at member stations across the country. Not all of them are reporters, but there's a lot of reporters out there. And you hear some of them on the air. Um, and, and some of them are really good, and some of them are young and up and coming, and some of them will one day be stars in NPR. Um, part of the trick is to figure out who's who and who's good at what. Um, we have had a system for a long time that brought some of those voices to our audiences, but maybe didn't take full advantage, maybe wasn't systematic enough. And so our collaborative project, and it's, and it's going even beyond what I'm going to talk about right now, but at a basic level, we are just trying to figure out how do we take the best of what these folks are doing and integrate it more with what people are thinking about in Washington. And so imagine having NPR reporters on phone calls, conference calls, in communication with member station reporters all over the country who have the same expertise. And it turns out that there are a lot of station reporters who are really good on energy environment. There are a lot of really good reporters on criminal justice. There are a lot of really good reporters on military and veterans affairs. And so the trick was, how do you convene them? Because it turns out that all of them are doing stories, and all of them are reporting stuff, and some of it gets on their local station, and you never hear it if you don't live where they are. And some of it makes its way to the national air, and none of them knew each other. And so now we've created a project in which these people are talking. We had a call today that I missed because I was kind of coming over here. <laughs> um, but and, and, and somebody else ran it, but we had a whole bunch of military and veterans reporters on the phone today planning stories that you will hear. Um, and, and that didn't used to happen. And it seems sort of obvious that this would be a good way to do it, but we weren't built that way. And so you have to structure your organization in a way that makes these things happen. And what it takes oftentimes is an editor who can hear ideas and how a good idea in one part of the country connects to a good idea in another and then bring that together. Yeah. Was it hard convincing those editors to you know, allow the reporters to join in this and dedicate time? What you, yes, I mean, it's a really interesting question because one of the things you have to do is you have to, you have to align different interests. And you can imagine that if you're running a station uh, in San Diego or uh, in the Midwest somewhere, that you also have a local audience, and you have, you have needs that have to be fulfilled, and you have a small newsroom, and you don't have a lot of people who you can spare. And so there's a sort of tug of war between do I take care of my local needs or do I, do I take care of national NPR? Mm -hmm. And the trick is to find some common ground, some value for both, so that it's worth their time to give up their reporter to just talk with a bunch of other reporters on the same topic, and maybe there won't be a story that comes back to you, but that's still worth your time. It's an investment in that person. And so that's the kind of thing we're doing. And you know, to your question, the role of the editor is to be the diplomat and find ways to make that work and to then, at the end of it, show that you got something more by participating than you would have if you had done it the old way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, and sometimes that takes time. So. It takes a lot of yeah. time. <laughs> um, and Jean, so we talked about the reentry project, and um, you explained a little bit in your opening, and that was temporary and separate? We're in separate, We're separate right now, but, yeah. but <laughs> transitioning into another model, right? The lizard, exactly. the chameleon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the chameleon. <laughs> chameleon. <laughs> so one of the common challenges of this type of collaboration um, is that outlets that normally would compete with each other this is a little different than what Bruce is talking about, the NPR affiliates in different stations. These are organizations that are not connected in any, any way, um, and they compete. So how, how do you manage that, and how did you get them to the point where they were willing to work together? Um, I'm, you know, it's funny. So the, the way that this started, um, I am originally from Philadelphia. I was abroad reporting for many years, and I moved back a couple years ago. Um, and Solutions Journalism Network hired me 
to in sort of what they considered a pilot project if they wanted to create um, chapters or sort of communities in different cities um, with someone spearheading this effort to just kind of create community amongst journalists who shared the solutions oriented approach. Um, and it was a so it was a very vague mission. Um, and the idea was, you know, do some workshops, do some trainings. So I started getting together with the few journalists that I knew in town to talk about how could we make it be a little bit more interesting than people just talking about solutions journalism. And this one reporter that I met with, who has you know, been at the Inquirer for 30 years, said, why don't we do a collaborative project where we get all the local newsrooms together doing solutions-oriented reporting around one specific topic? And I said, that's a great idea. Um, she said, what about reentry from prison? It was something, she's an employment beat reporter. It was something she was personally interested in. I said, that sounds fantastic. Um, she didn't know that I had done reporting on the issue previously, but um, I, I saw that it had potential in the sense that it could be covered from a variety of beats without you know, tons of overlap. There's not a whole lot of scoops in reentry, so you can kind of mitigate the, the competitiveness that sometimes is inherent in our profession. Um, so I started just literally sort of one by one going to the different outlets in Philadelphia, you know, getting intros to, to the top folks and saying, hey, here's this idea. What do you think of it? And from the beginning, almost every person said, yep, we're in. Um, WHYY, for example, took a little bit more time, not because they weren't interested, but they wanted to make sure that if they joined on, they would have you know the staff and resources to dedicate to you it. You were talking to executives. You want exactly. To I was talking to um, you know that time the editor in chief of the Inquirer, the person who was the editor in chief of Philadelphia Magazine, the president of WURD, who's the um, which is the Black Talk radio station in Philly. Um, so getting sort of buy-in from the top. Um, and I was, you know, surprised, but very encouraged. And then from that point forward, once I kind of had that initial, yeah, sounds like a good idea, I, I brought together kind of a planning committee of about seven of those outlets, I guess. Um, and they built it, really, right? So it wasn't me who designed it. Um, it was me along with a, a group of people who were saying, here's what's going to work for us. Here's what's not going to work for us. You know, they were very clear that what later became my position as project editor, it should be more sort of manager or director. They didn't want someone external doing line edits on stories. You know, they didn't want that sort of um, intrusion, but they wanted something. They wanted to be able to feel like they were working as a team towards, you know, kind of a larger goal, which is increasing awareness around this issue that's very important for Philadelphia because we have the highest incarceration rate um, of the 10 largest cities in, uh, in the United States. And so I, I think that's what helped us address the competitive stuff, was people mm -hmm. just felt from the beginning this is yeah. worthy. You know, we've been competitors for a long time. Why not we all try coming together and working on this one, mm -hmm. you know, unique project? Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that everyone immediately said yes when you approach them. I mean, I feel like that is something, the larger sort of in the ether type of thing about collaboration right now. Well, the topic. And the topic they too. Buy I into mean, the topic. Yeah, that's that's something we found too. In this yeah, the it's really topic important. is compelling. Mm -hmm. For the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, it it seems it seems more natural for news organizations to work with other news organizations because we're in the same field. But partnering with a tech company, especially one of the largest ones in the world, um, probably is, seems a little bit uh, more of a stretch for some news organizations. So Erica, you spent a lot of time at Twitter doing news partnerships, of course, and now. Um, with your time at Google and the News Lab, for for the ones that you've been involved in, that Google News Lab has been involved in, like Election Land and working with First Draft, how do those typically, from your end, get initiated? Mm -hmm. And then how do you decide at Google where it makes sense for you to partner? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm just sitting here thinking about my days working at CBS News and how I feel like the competition is like a thing of a different generation. I mean, certainly like the big three CBS, the broadcasters, like we all know an AP and UPI, like the way they used to compete for the breaking news story, but like Twitter disrupted that. I mean, Twitter took away the, no, one was, no one's competing for the scoop anymore. I mean, certainly there are some big scoops, especially we saw last year in the elections and really big scoops about Trump's taxes and other things that great investigative journalists found. Um, but... I do feel like we're in a different era where collaboration is, is 
so important. And I, you know, for us, like, I have a lot of brilliant teammates who aren't up here today, Simon Rogers, Olivia Ma, um, people who have, you know, a lot of relationships. We have a lot of relationships. We come from the news side, so we speak the language, we understand the challenges. And when I think about first draft or election land, like election land was a conversation that started between Scott Klein at ProPublica and Simon Rogers and Claire Wardle and just three people talking, we should do this. There's this need to, can we build a pop-up newsroom around a specific topic of debunking issue, misinformation and issues happening at the polls? Can we bring in students? Can we bring in different technology from you know, Google technology, Google Trends, to Data Miner, to CrowdTangle, Slack? And really like just imagine a future newsroom um, where people are working around a single topic but not from the same organizations. And, you know, I think people are willing, I think people are willing to take risks together right now to figure out what the future looks like. And so that's the sweet spot for the News Lab because we're all about collaboration and trying to use Google's technology and resources for um, figuring things out. So I don't know, we go where, where for me personally, like there's, where there's like great ideas and great energy and things we haven't done before where we could really have impact because for us as a big company, it's about impact. And I think election land led to full fact in the UK, which led to cross check, which are all projects we've been involved in. Now we look ahead to 2018. What's the next iteration of this look like? How can we have more impact on the things that journalists are debunking? Um, how does that feed back into platforms such as ours and such as Facebook and Twitter? So, um, it's really just the relationships between platforms and publishers is so important. So these kinds of projects provide a great opportunity for us yeah. to work together. I was just going to say one of the, I think, important insights there is the idea that one thing leads to another. That you can't just view any one project as sort of an end in itself. Because, you know, they all have something that worked about them and they all have something that wasn't quite what you'd hoped for. But the trick is to, like, take election land, say, and then turn it into, you know, some part of it becomes something else and so forth and so on, so that, so that each time you're moving to another level. Because these things work, you know, you learn stuff. If you have a collaboration, if you work with a team, I mean, the first time you do it, it's always bumpy. It, you know, there's relationship kind of things where you have to learn how to work together. And if, and if at the end of that, all you do is, is go on to something completely different without building on that, then you don't get as far as you could. You, you, know, you need to go back and work with those people again on something different and learn from the first time. That's a really important point. And talk about in detail what didn't work. Like, what made you uncomfortable last time? Things don't Why work. Things, work? Yeah. things won't work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was Jennifer Preston last week, a couple weeks ago at the Google News Lab Summit, who said, we have a moment now. You know, we really do have a moment where I, it feels like Many of our industry are interested in working in the public's interest together mm -hmm. rather than in our own interest only. But I'm curious from your perspectives too, if there's any difference in media. I mean, uh, we all work together because this is how we, we are built and we manage collaborations in New Jersey and we're all journalists or former journalists. But um, in different parts of the country, folks really don't think like that. I mean, I remember we were at an event earlier this year where Jim Schachter from WNYC, great partner of ours, um, was on a panel, and one of the members of his panel said something like, um, I would never work with another organization. She was like really surprised, and why would you ever do that? And I was surprised, <laughs> she was surprised. So I, I, do you see differences in types of media or parts of the country? Yeah? I certainly have, and that, so we have 15-member um, organizations, no TV stations. Um, we approached the. It was a TV it station. Was a TV. It was, yeah, that's fine. Um, and and yeah. your comments yeah. about being in a TV station as well. I, yeah. I do think there is still some of that mentality. Um, the couple of TV stations that we approached, one, it was clear they were actually uncomfortable with the topic and they didn't feel like it was, you know, right for their audience. Um, the other one, though, it was absolutely why would we ever do something that would benefit, you know, Philly.com? That makes no sense to me. You know, see you later, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I do have hope, actually, that next year we might be able to get one station on. They have a new managing editor. She seems really enthusiastic, so that may change. But I have seen certainly a difference in yeah. medium. If you look at Panama Papers, it's like one of the most successful exactly. collaborative journalism projects. And so many organizations of different sizes work together in that. It's so phenomenal how they all got something out of it. Of course, it served the public interest, but it also, uh, 
it also brought these you know, small news organizations an opportunity to do meaningful work they couldn't have otherwise Absolutely. done. And also grow their reporters' skill sets, too, when they were especially collaborating on some <coughs> data. I mean, we heard that when um, they were here earlier this year presenting at, at the summit. Um, yeah, but, that, but that's the kind of project that, that almost by definition is sort of additive. You could just keep adding partners yeah. to that because, because anybody who gets access to a secret database with that much stuff, one, there's so much stuff in there that are you ever going to find it all? But two, for any additional partner, it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't take away from the other partner's audience. Mm -hmm. right. You know, you're, you're, you're all winning. And so there's no, it's not a zero sum game to be part of a project like that. You know, if you had the Snowden documents, you got to do Snowden coverage. And the, the thing I also feel like I, talking to people who work in the Panama Papers is like, the, the I, I don't want to use a gender, I would say a gentleman's agreement. It doesn't mean to be gender, <laughs> um, but like just the agreement of like, um, what you know, agreeing on the date of when they were going right. to actually release, start to release stories in the Panama Papers was a massive conversation involving different time zones and different people and egos, I'd imagine. And like, so you know, having people who can build consensus and be diplomats about what's the best for the project, um, you have to like give and take. I mean, we give and take too in working in partnerships all the time. We're yeah. not always going to get exactly what we want, but how do you figure out what is best for the project? And so it does take a, a certain mental approach of knowing you're gonna give and get. Yes, yeah. And sometimes, a couple of the projects we've worked on in New Jersey, um, one partner will say, we're totally in, as long as that partner's not involved. <laughs> right. you know, mm. So there is still mm -hmm. like <laughs> some co co competition for sure, yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned when you were presenting the report earlier, Sarah, was um, talking about how specific topics, we talked a little bit about this with the reentry project, really seemed to spark interest in cooperation and collaboration. Um, and many of those are investigative and accountability. Um, so I know that that's, those are some things you've worked on, Bruce. What do you think? Why do you think those sorts of investigative stories, like the Panama Papers or accountability stories, tend to be more open to collaboration? So, so I think, first of all, one, they're, they're high impact. So, so people who, who want to work on and call these projects, because these are, these, are the, these are almost one-offs. These are in your category of sort of short term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to be part of something big, and so something investigative fits. Um, the other thing is I think that, that organizations working together you're, everybody's bringing something different. So you're looking for different skill sets. And, and you know, people want to be part of an NPR project a lot of times because we bring an audience. You know, I mean, I mean if, if, if you have this story and you want to team up with us, you know that you're going to get a huge audience. And so that's maybe the value we bring. Other partners in a project bring data skills, you know, unique investigative skills that not every organization has. So, you know, I know that a sort of global economy is sort of out of fashion these days. The idea that trade, you know, everybody specializes and, and, a, and, a, and a more efficient economy is based on the idea that you play to specialization. Well, that's kind of what this is about, is that a partnership works when everybody, everybody is bringing a unique skill. And, and you know, ProPublica is a great example. I mean, what they can bring in terms of data sets and the analysis that goes with that dovetails with their partners in ways that makes it work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things you talked about there was impact. And, and one of the things that we hear a lot, and we saw a lot in this research, and we hear a lot in New Jersey too, is what am I going to get out of it? You know, well, what am I going to get out of it? And how, and so how do you track metrics and what's important to one organization that's not important to another? Um, what, how do we track success or that going forward? What are some of those things that you see? I mean, I can briefly speak to CrossCheck, which was the collaborative journalism project um, that we did at Google News Lab, um, First Draft Coalition, AFP, and about 37 news organizations did around the French election um, a few months ago. And they're actually, so there were 63 stories that were debunked. Mm -hmm. in that project. Um, everything from Macron, is he wearing an earpiece, and you know, just rumors that were occurring on the internet. And so 63 stories were debunked and corrected and shared. But there's um, research that I think First Draft is working on right now that will come out that's looking at this exact question. of So we've done this, but what was the impact 
did people, did you know, French voters, were they impacted by the corrections? Did they see the corrections? So that's a question that we're really honed in on and supportive of figuring out because we want to know impact for sure and figure out what techniques are working to um, better inform people in real time. Can I ask you what um, did you what kind of data was collected as the project was going? What, what sort of metrics are, were collected or other data? That's a good question. Um, I don't know in detail, but I'm sure that Claire knows. Yeah, Claire knows <laughs> <Okay>. everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll walking. ask her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I'm sure she's planning on talking a bit about it because I know she's Great. ruthlessly focused on that and looking at impact. So it's something that came up a lot is that there was there's not yet a standard metric or set of metrics that collaborations have that are looking at. You know, there are people who are certainly keeping track, anecdotal evidence, but there does not seem yet to be any sort of standard metric or set of metrics um, to assess collaborations. Every project is different, right? Because yeah. cross-check and election lines yeah. specifically trying to debunk, you know, the projects that you're doing are, are quite different. Um, documenting hate, very different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, um, yep. yeah. And sometimes the partner news organizations involved want something more specific mm -hmm. to them and their audience. That's what they want to know sometimes right. too. Like, should I dedicate a reporter to another project? Well, what did it bring to me? Did mm -hmm. it widen my audience? Did it widen my reach? That, yeah. Those are important questions too. I mean, as as Bruce said, you know, this is collaborations are always a bit messy. There's always bumps in the road, and I can certainly say from my perspective, I think one of the um, things we didn't do so well at the outset was really clarifying um, <clears throat> what impact we wanted to have, you know, what our specific mission was, um, not necessarily mission, but, but more specific impact that we wanted to come out with and then, you know, track towards that goal. Um, it's something I'm thinking about as we move into year two, being much more strategic in how we think about, you know, what we, what we want to come out of this with. Um, and, and we're looking at it sort of twofold. One is internally, right, journalistically, what, what impact um, are we having, can we have on the organizations that we work with? And then, and then in the broader scheme, you know, what impact can we have in the field of reentry or, or whatever our next topic is? Um, and I think both of those, at least for our project, are equally important. I, I think this whole question of, of measuring is really critical because you can't go on the assumption that, oh, collaboration, that's, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, in and of itself. Exactly. It's a means to an end, right? Like, so what's the end? What are you trying to accomplish? And there's a lot of different ways to think about it. You can think about it in terms of the journalism. You know, and, and there are ways, and that all feels very soft, like, oh, we have better stories. Well, how do you know they're better stories? But you can break down if you have definitions of quality. You can say, okay, we are doing a higher level of investigative work. We are doing more interviews that with newsmakers that, that are, are, have impact. We are doing you know, higher quality enterprise type stories that other people don't have that are unique. And so you can sort of measure it that way. Um, you, can, you can measure things in terms of audience. So you know, for us, this is enormously important. But if you, if you generate a, a network that actually reaches more people, you should see that more listeners are there. And, and you know, industry-wide, I think a lot of people's numbers are up. But, but um, that's something that's actually tangible and can be, can be tracked. And so audience is, is a critical metric. And then another thing you can look at you know, from our point of view, is, is talent development. I mean, you, you, have to be, you have to be building the next generation of journalists. You have to be finding people who you might not have found otherwise. So you can track that. You can find out who are the good editors, who are the great reporters. And projects that force you to engage and work with these people and spot talent early and then track them over time, uh, that's another way you can measure success. And I think the collaborative model works for all of those. It works for the journalism, it works for the audience, and it works for the, for the talent and the, and the journalists who are going to be coming up. And so I think there are ways that you can, can actually measure success, but you have to be really kind of rigorous about it. This is a, that's a question we've been getting as we were doing the research and also as we did the summit. How do we know whether we should do this? How do I, especially for folks who might be reporters or not the leadership, how do I sell this to my editor? And they're going to say, why should I do this? Right. And you need to be able to have, like, here's why it's going to. <laughs> Everything I'm doing is, like, what's in it for me. Yes, exactly. You know, and there has to be something. I mean, yeah. why, why do right. it if, there's, if it's just, if you're just, you know, using resources but just getting more of the same? Mm 
there has to be something different. Yes, yeah, exactly. and better. Yep. One of the things that I didn't really talk about uh, in the talk just now, but that I talk about a lot in the report, is this um, sort of learning that happens in collaborations as well. So sort of intergenerational learning, intermedium learning, internewsroom learning, mm -hmm. um, and that seems to me to fit in this bucket of talent development, but also sort of workflow. I mean, I can see an entire newsroom benefiting from. I think you told a story, Jean about an event that was pulled together really quickly and another editor came and was like amazed that this small scrappy newsroom had pulled together an event that had so many people so quickly and it was like a workflow light bulb, right? So that's another yeah. metric mm. if that, but again, a squishy one, yeah. but like somehow. Mm -hmm. well, I, I would just add one little thing, which is that, and this is a cultural thing, but I notice it that I used to joke that in our newsroom, um, you, could, you could divide the newsroom into people who write on walls and people who don't. You know that there there is a sort of culture, and it's and it's a younger culture, it's a digital culture, and I think that the collaborative effort dovetails a little bit with the sort of digital movement in that the 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 sort of culture of an old newsroom, which was very top down, hierarchical, big big powerful editor at the center telling everybody what to do, and reporters racing around trying to beat each other on stories, has given away a little bit to to the kind of team. Uh, you know, agile approach in which everybody's having little quick 15-minute stand-up meetings. And, and that kind of digital approach works really well with a collaborative model in terms of journalism because it's all about let's bring the five or six people together who, who have a stake in this story and figure out how we're going to work together, put together a team, go do it, and then do a, a rigorous after action and move on to the next thing. And I think it's not a coincidence that this is happening at the same time that a generation of people who are kind of digital natives are now in newsrooms mm -hmm. and bringing that culture. And if you're in our newsroom now and you walk around, you've got people doing Facebook videos over here and you've got people doing stand-up meetings over there. And 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen anything like that. And again, it's like there's people who write on walls and brainstorm and there's people who don't. And the people who do are coming up with, with fresher ways of thinking about doing this job. I write on walls a lot. Stephanie does write on walls a lot, writing walls. writing walls. Yeah. Yeah. Post-its everywhere. I know. Speaking of, uh, of, of, of workflow, as we touched on earlier in resources, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, um, okay, we want to work together. What do we, how do we do that technically? What do we use? And I think as Erica knows, probably most of our um, collaborations across the country are built within Google Docs and Google <laughs> Drive. I, probably that's, I would imagine, one of the most common methods that we use for collaboration in technology. But I was you know, curious to hear more from your perspective, Erica, on tools of tech, and also from Jean and Bruce, on how when you have organizations that are in different newsrooms, with different CMSs, um, they have different levels of skill. Um, you know, you're talking in Slack, you've got email, you've got your Google Drive, you've got this and that. How do you tie all that together hmm. for anyone? It's a good question. It's a big um, opportunity, really, to build the, the tools of the future. I think um, in election land, you know, Slack was used um, in a big way. I think there were Slack channels for every 50 state. Um, so there were catchers who were catching and finding things on social media that, or on Google Trends that were worth debunking. And then they, if it happened in Indiana, it was put in the Indiana Slack channel. And there were people looking at that and taking it, verifying it, moving it to the next Slack channel. So. Um, Slack was a huge, huge part of that. Um, Medan built a tool that was also used, a collaborative journalism tool. Um, but yeah, people always go back to Google Docs and, and Google Sheets. And you know, people use Google Docs because you can collaborate in them. And you can see track changes, and you can make comments. And it's just an easy way to communicate. Um, I think it's, we're still in an early phase of like what tools are needed. I also just want to say there's the workflow tools, but then there's also like the tools like we built for documenting hate using the Google Cloud Natural Language Processing API, which is a totally new tool that's specifically looking at identifying um, information for journalists so that they can write stories. So there's the workflow tools, and then there's like specialized tools that can help enable a project. And we definitely hack on both and try and figure out. And the great thing about you know election line and cross check is we got a lot of feedback about how. Google Docs could be improved, and that wasn't something we necessarily went into, like looking for that feedback, but we got it, and that's great. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious how you've been managing that, Gene, in, in Philly, because you've got organizations that probably aren't tied together on any sort of tech right. platform right. at all. Right, in any way. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a, a lot of my job is just kind of managing. So within each um, 
partner outlet, there's normally one, sometimes two kind of people that I'm coordinating directly with. Um, and I would have about five who are great at Slack, super easy, you know, to communicate with them there, and we can coordinate in that way. Um, there's some folks who respond much better to email. Some people I need to give a phone call if I want to get any response. So part of I see part of my job as the manager just figuring out how people um, communicate comfortably, and in a collaboration of our size, you know, relinquishing the idea that we're all going to be on Slack all the time, and it's just going to work for everyone. Um, and so once I kind of gave that up, it became much simpler to say, all right, with this person I do this, with this person I do this. It's a little bit more time consuming. But um, so much of this work, at least I found in Philadelphia, it's about relationship building, right? You know, I'm, I'm working with incredibly busy people um, who have a million other things to do every day other than what I want them to focus on. They're not my employees. You know, it's, they're essentially volunteers working on this project. And so I have to find a way to you know, communicate enough with them that they feel looped in and energized and enthusiastic about what we're doing, but not that it's a burden or it's overwhelming in any way. Um, and everyone has a different kind of threshold for that. And, and I have to figure it out. Um, and I think that's part of what keeps us moving forward. When they're sharing content. Well, I'm sorry. While you're answering yeah. Stephanie's next question, anyone who has a question in the audience. Yes, um, we're going to go to the audience. Be thinking yeah. about their question. Yes, just a second. Yeah. Um, just a quick question following up on that. How do they share content? So um, the, way that, the way that we work is the Rancher Project has um, a central website, therancherproject.org, um, which essentially we cull all of the stories relating to reentry that any of our partners produce. What we put on there is um, headline, picture, um, you know, sort of a subheading, and then it links directly back out to the originating site. Because we didn't want to pull traffic away, right? We didn't want to just be reposting and having people only come eyes, have eyes on our site. We wanted to direct traffic out. So that's, that's one way that it's, it's kind of shared. And then, you know, Facebook, social, we put it all out that way. There are a couple of our members, Billy.com and Billy Penn, who have reentry project pages within their own website. So on that site, similarly, um, they have all of the reporting that they produce, but also their partners reporting, which is cool. Um, but same thing, linking back out to the original pages. Um, in terms of the co-creation, we haven't done a lot of it, but we've certainly done some. I think we've had maybe, I don't know, between five and 10 kind of jointly reported stories. So that's when you know a reporter from HYY takes a trip with a photographer from PMN to Lancaster County to do a story on why they have the lowest recidivism rate in Pennsylvania, right? And then um, he writes text for um, Philly.com. He does an audio piece for WHYY, and it kind of comes out together. Um, so we've had several of those collaborations um, happen sort of cross newsroom. Yep, yeah. And there definitely is technology being developed in this area. Um, like I think of Channel X out of Chicago. I think of um, Collective, uh, Heather Bryant's project, Facet. Like mm -hmm. there's definitely some mm -hmm. um, work here. And, and you're a host writer. And there are others. So um, we have some questions, hopefully, in the audience. Um, I worked for a long time for CBS and particularly for network radio and broadcast and technical operations. So. All of the things you're saying to me, I supported CBS News Network, um, and I keep thinking, because it's my native space, about the architecture behind um, the, the pieces you're presenting. So, for instance, I know that, um, and this may be a little out of date, National Public Radio has this great situation where member stations upload to shared to a file server, they can download anything from any other station. They can share anything they want. Typically, it's uh, whole broadcasts. But is there any sort of that sort of service going on for your collaborative materials where it isn't just that you're sharing, and I don't mean dismissively just, but simply sharing information <coughs> or approaches or concepts, or you do this piece and we'll do this piece, but really what you're tech actually sharing is a complete piece an audio piece, a video piece, into some sort of shared architecture with cross permissions. Hmm. You guys well, are doing well, that, this, right? uh, this, I mean, the, the idea of being able to share the elements 
of the, 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 the component parts before they become the finished piece is, is to me one of the things we have to figure out how to do. And, and since other people have already done it, <laughs> my, my sense is that this, this is a fixable problem. But that imagine the power you know, across a network. And again, you, you said something that r resonates with me, which is like none of, I am not the boss of any of these member stations. You know? <laughs> I have to ask nicely. And, <laughs> and, 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 and in the category of what's in it for them, well, one of the things that's what's in it for them and in it for us too is the idea that all of this material is being created. People are interviewing people right and left, and then you use 12 seconds in a piece. Well, what about the other 20 minutes? I bet there was something good in it. And, and why not share that? And somebody else will find something of value in that. And, and so, and that's, a, that's at one level an editorial problem, and at another level it's a technical problem. And, and it's something that, that we are thinking about, because I think that it would make us much more powerful. And it's, and it's sort of a metaphor for the broader problem of, of a system um, that has knowledge in one part of the organization but not in another. And how do you how do you break down those walls? And I think that that's one one thing we have to try to do. Um, hi, I'd be interested um, to hear um, uh, some examples of the the really successful collaborations where there's been you know uh, like really something that that would not have happened otherwise. You know, like great stories that would not have happened otherwise, or what kind of situations uh, that it works best in. Because when I when I hear collaboration, um, I hear really long meetings where no one gets anything <laughs> done. You know what I mean? So um, and I and I'm sure that in your experience there have been things that were you know situations that haven't worked. But what really works? I mean, is there is there emerging something that uh, that 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 really fits the collaborative model? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I I mean I think. Um, I mean, obviously, Panama Papers comes to mind. That's an extraordinary effort. But I think what we're finding works for us is like event, events-based, elections-based efforts, um, where there's going to be an increasing, a larger, perhaps, amount of misinformation um, being shared or disinformation. And people are going to inadvertently share things they don't on social media that they don't know is true or untrue. So that pre presents kind of a hyper-focused moment for journalists to work together to debunk things. So. That's something we're focused on, I think event-based moments, election-based moments. And we could certainly expand, but we're seeing success right now there. Um, so I would say, well, first of all, we have one meeting per month, and it's an hour and a half long, and that's all I require. <laughs> um, so it's not a ton of long meetings, though there are some there's side conversations that happen. Um, so for us, I would say, um, I think the answer is twofold. I mean, in, in terms of the reporting, you know, in the past nine months or so, we've done probably close now to 150 stories on the issue of reentry in Philadelphia. Um, and certainly some of those would have happened, whether the collaborative existed or not. Um, but I think one of the things, at least that I'm proud of, of the work that we've done, is we've really brought this issue that um, was just kind of simmering in the city to the surface. Um, so I think the reporting has been has been great, just sort of the amount, and it's 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 just put the issue sort of on the table in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and I think we've, you know, again, this is like it's squishy, it's anecdotal stuff, but um, I ran into a young woman recently who uh, runs a project that works with people who are incarcerated as, as juveniles. Um, and she said to me, um, she said, the reentry project has totally changed my perception of media and what it can be good for. And you know, I think I think people have been impressed that um, we do take sort of social impact seriously, right? It's all of these news organizations saying we want to increase, you know, awareness about this really important issue. Um, and I think she just felt like the stuff that she did that was always kind of sidelined was was validated. In terms of, right. Sign of a 
a reporter in okay, Asia right. to do file on this, and you tie someone's old interview. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, essentially, so from the sort of large perspective, we have an MOU that everyone kind of signs, although, as I said before, it's completely voluntary, and I don't, we haven't even looked at it since it was written. Um, <laughs> <laughs> essentially, the each newsroom is kind of responsible for doing its own reporting, right? So um, often I will have ideas and I'll chat with some editors and they'll maybe assign reporters, but a lot of it is the reporters coming up with ideas on their own and doing their own reporting. So it's kind of just, um, it, it's kind of, it's just encouraging stuff that maybe would have happened before and, and pushing it a little bit farther. Um, we all try to let each other know when stories are coming out. That doesn't always happen. There's often, you know, reporting that comes out that I didn't know that story was coming out today. Um, but, you know, when they can, editors let me know. Um, and it's, but it is, the reporting itself really does happen, you know, within the newsroom, kind of in its normal channels with some prodding, I would say, for me in some cases. Nope. So we that was talked about at the beginning. Um, I feel like you know maybe it's something that we could get to in the next iteration. Um, but there isn't unless it's kind of from the beginning established. You know, the WHYY reporter is going to work with the Inky reporter on this story. There isn't that back end collaboration. So are you going to jump in? Yeah, go for it. Really quickly, like on election land. So there were over two hundred news organizations out, across America that were signed up to an email listserv and so and also following the blog so basically the idea was like when things were debunked or corrected this was a service it's almost like a not a wire service I mean that's overstating it but providing information directly to those newsrooms so that they had additional information to act on to verify or, or to correct um, or just to communicate with their community so that was one way I think on election land that we were trying to and with crosscheck we were trying to make sure that stuff was spreading to provide service opportunities to other news organizations. Let me, let me um, take a run at this in, in a slightly different way and to, and to think about this, think about it as not a project. A project to me is, mm. is, is like, oh, there's this thing you want to do and you're going to pull together a team and you're going to go do that one thing and then the project's over. And what we're trying to do is actually create collaboration as the model for how you do what you do every day, ongoing, okay? Um, and they're different, and it actually, it, it's an important difference. And so then the question that you ask is, so are you getting anything better for having to talk to each other? Um, and, and I'll give you a couple, couple examples. One very straightforward, fairly recent, um, Texas. Texas created a statewide collaborative. Now, the thing, the starting point is, is like, oh, it's all public, radio stations, so they're all on the same team, except they're kind of not. I mean, that's the nature of the business is that we're simultaneously, you know, public media together and we're competitors. And so you have four big markets down there, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. And the, the state legislature has a special session. And in the old model, four stations send four reporters, and in this year, iteration, the bathroom bill is the big thing. So everybody covers that. That would be the way you do it in the old model. And then everybody goes back because they're competitors. And in Dallas, you hear the Dallas story. And in San Antonio, you hear the San Antonio story. And, and you're all hearing the same, the same topic, just four reporters doing it. What they did this time was basically say, hey, we're a statewide collaborative. So we're going to get together ahead of time. We know we have to do the bathroom bill. So you get that. But we're going to assign Dallas, you're going to do this aspect of it. And San Antonio, you're going to do that aspect, and so forth. And so now what happened was four reporters went, but four reporters did four different aspects of the story, dug a little deeper than they would have otherwise, shared the content on all the stations, and not just the four, but statewide. So 26 Texas stations got the coverage. And now they got four times as much content for the same investment in resources. And that becomes the model going forward. So when the hurricane hits and Houston is overwhelmed and just trying to keep up with Houston, the group gets together. And I sat on this call. I was on the call as they planned it. And it's, and it's San Antonio, we're going to take Corpus. And Dallas, we're going to take 
this place. And all the affected communities were covered by stations not in those communities, and then the content was shared everywhere. That didn't happen a few years ago. And, and, and the community in Texas is better served for it. That's such a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a great point. Because when you think of news events like that and how traditionally there would be six reporters doing the same thing, all doing the same thing, going to end up producing a similar story in six different places. Now you can talk ahead of time and deploy them differently so that we go deeper and we get better stories. Like, what it took was working together and then trusting that, oh, if you edit the story for my yeah. station, mm -hmm. it'll be good. Right. And that, you know, that, that's a leap of faith. But that comes from working together, mm -hmm. getting to know each other, trusting, and then, and then doing it again and not just moving on yeah. to your next thing. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what's happening more and more. Um, if you were going to start a collaborative or cooperative news organization, uh, newsroom or news network from the ground up, what would be some key foundational issues that you seek to address? I think that would be easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> foundational issue. I mean, I think you have, so one, you have to have, you have to have a sort of common set of standards and ethics and practices. You know, there has to be an agreement on like what, what is, what is the right way to do stuff? What are, what are the ethical standards? But, and then you have to have a sort of training regimen that, that ensures that people trust each other. Um, you know, I think that's almost foundational. You know, what are what are the ethics of, of what we're trying to do, and what are our standards? Um, then I think you know we are we are big advocates right now of of editors as an important aspect of, of the business, and and NPR is very much a kind of production program culture. Um, you know, Morning Edition, All Things Considered. I mean, that they they are big. There's big gravitational pull there. Um, and you know, whereas newspapers have the, the kind of tradition of the strong editor, um, we talk a lot about how the role of the editor has changed dramatically. And so what we're talking about now are, are people who, who aren't just moving copy, but are, but are really thinking big about coverage objectives. Like, what is the purpose? What is the mission we are trying to accomplish? You know, in your project, you know, you have a, you have a focus. You know what you are about. Uh, for an organization like ours, which is doing broad, broad national coverage, local coverage, regional coverage, you know, there are more layers to that. But for any aspect of a collaborative project, there has to be a sort of a vision, and there has to be somebody who has the kind of unique skill set that allows you to sort of orchestrate, because the the sort of role of the conductor is is way more important than it than it probably used to be, and this is not. Oftentimes, you know, again, if you're starting from scratch, would you have an organization that's more hierarchical? Maybe, maybe not. But in most cases, you have partners that have that have some interests that align and some interests that don't. And so you have to have somebody who can who can find the common ground. And and you know, I'm sure there's plenty more that yeah. we could talk about. But those are sort of a few things that come to mind. There, there actually, I mean, if you think about you know ProPublica. Um, the Marshall Project. I mean, there actually have been organizations that have begun as sort of with collaboration built into the DNA of what they do. And, um, you know, they seem to be uh, less hierarchical, um, though there are certainly project editors and project managers. I mean, it seems like that was one of the trends that emerged from the report, is that that's really a key component, is having someone who is at least part of their time um, managing the collaboration and, and sort of taking care of all these sort of logistical um, and other other issues that come up. Um, but it, it's just sort of like a culture shift. I mean, I think that story you just told is so perfect. I mean, Jim Schachter told another anecdote that's in the report about how when he used to be a reporter in Florida and how much that's changed in a very similar way to what Bruce just described. Um, it's a culture shift. I mean, I would say that that's one of the foundational elements is like having this mindset that we're going to collaborate and we're going to get more and it's going to be good. Yeah. It, I think for me, if I were to answer that question and think about what like a co-op newsroom looked like or a collaborative project, I mean, you start with the technology, like what, what's needed? Mm. What resources have been reduced or stripped or defunded or underfunded inside of newsrooms that are critical to the creation of journalism, whether that is 
um, the most obvious things like, I don't know, time to go out and cover a story, research capabilities to find information, all the way down to like journalists going to you know, the Middle East but not having insurance because they're going as freelancers and not as you know, part of CBS News. There's like a million things you could come up with in that chain of what it takes to create great journalism that I don't think all journalists and freelancers have access to. So I would probably think through like what if the technology is. I mean, insurance is not a good example. That's not technology, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways in which I think tech companies could help by building the solutions that are needed to create journalism. Whether you're creating it um, on 45th Avenue at the New York Times, or you're creating it out of you know your home um, as a freelancer somewhere in, in Latin America. So. I think about it from a technology standpoint, which is there's a ton of opportunity um, to create shared resources for journalists. And the report uh, that we released today is, is focused on newsroom to newsroom collaboration. But one of the things that we want to get more into and look at in the future is other collaborations, collaborations with libraries, um, collaborations with local citizens or civic groups, those sorts of things too, technology companies, because we see journalists you know, we're finally okay to work with each other, <laughs> and you know, we're getting there slowly. Um, and working with other organizations too, I think, would be important if you're building something from scratch and thinking outside our own bubble too. Mike's got a question. Yeah, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, we could do two more for sure. Yeah. Um, well, first, thanks for coming here. It's like really interesting to hear all your different perspectives. And my question is actually directly related to. Something that Stephanie just said, which was, I know that there's going to be interest in looking at collaborations outside of the newsroom, technology, um, te uh, civic technology, nonprofits, community organizations. And this question is really for Regine, but I think it's kind of for everyone is what experiences have you had with community collaborations, especially with social justice organizations? Because I think that community newsroom collaborations are a natural outgrowth from community engagement. And so I was curious to know how you worked with community organizations in a way that wasn't simply extraction of information, but true collaboration. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. And um, I have two concrete examples. So um, we have a couple events coming up this fall. One is a hackathon. Um, so we are planning that together with the Rantry Coalition, which is um, sort of the city agency that's a uh, an alliance of the 80 some service providers and um, on reentry and also the city office of open data and technology um, and code for Philly. And so, you know, from the beginning, we decided, you know, we thought this might be a fun idea. We went, you know, first to the coalition to say, what do you think of this? Is this interesting? You know, do you think there's a space to, or do you think it would be helpful to bring coders and technologists together with? formerly incarcerated people to talk about what possible digital solutions there are to reentry. And they said yes, and so we've been moving forward with that. Just last, this past Monday, we had like a needs assessment meeting where we brought together kind of a small group of service providers, formerly incarcerated people, uh, coders, and journalists to kind of talk through how the hackathon will look. Um, so that's one example. Another is um, our kind of big event that we're planning on November 15th. Um, it's going to be a, um, it's going to, we're calling them sort of lightning talks. It's called the Reentry Blueprint, Stories and Solutions from the Formerly Incarcerated. Um, and the idea is six kind of lightning talks or short TED style presentations, all by formerly incarcerated people talking about um, solutions to reentry, right? So ideas that they have and have already put into practice and they're actually working in the community. Um, and, and the way this came about was, you know, we realized we wanted to do some big kind of wrap-up event. Technically, our current grant ends November 30th. And, um, and I realized I wanted to do something that was, um, I mean, seems obvious, but that's, that's meaningful, you know, that, that was beneficial and not just an event to have an event. Um, so I started talking with, you know, some of the folks in the community at activist organizations that I've formed relationships with over the last year and said, what would be helpful? And so we came up with this idea um, and have formed kind of a small working group where it's essentially me, our event coordinator that we've um, hired, and, and a handful of formerly incarcerated people who have become kind of leaders in this community. So just last week, um, no, this week, we had to finalize the kind of logo and invitation for the event. 
Um, and when I sent it out to the working group saying, what do you think of the design, um, one of the, the folks that we had been working with kind of called me on it and said, I think our logo should be on there, right? Because it had just said presented by the Advantry Project. And I realized he was totally right. <laughs> you know, we were, you know, they were helping to plan this just as much as we were. Um, so we put the couple of, you know, logos from these community organizations on the event. It says presented by the Reentry Project in coordination with the Center for Returning Citizens and Frontline Dads. Um, and I sent it to all the partners saying, look, you know, you guys know, but I'm going to sort of reiterate the process that we've had in planning this event. Here's the logo. They've asked to be included on it. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Are you okay with this? And to be honest, I was a little bit nervous. I could have seen a couple of them saying, I'm not sure I want you know, us saying we're presenting with you know, these essentially activist organizations. Everyone responded to the email within an hour, which is first of all amazing, second of all <laughs> um, saying, looks great, I'm fine with it, move ahead. So those are some of the ways I've tried to kind of mitigate that, because you're right, any community engagement, you know, you are creating relationships and um, you know, journalism can, to a lot of people, feel incredibly imbalanced, where we, the journalists, are taking, 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 and we don't necessarily give back. So that's how I've been approaching it. Susan, you had a question. Thanks for these perspectives. And when is that event? November 15th. In the <laughs> evening? Or? In the evening, yes, yeah, 6 to 8.30 at the Franklin Institute, which really? is sort of a big museum in Philadelphia. Cool. It sounds Very wonderful. Cool. Susan Hagen with Civic Story. We've just started a series of videos on Camden. Um, Sarah, you, I might have missed it. There was too many roads being repaved. I'm sorry, I'm late. But have you just noticed in general a greater proclivity um, for collaboration among uh, nonprofit groups and or for profit, or is, or is it the same? Or have you encountered plenty of mixed mixed groups? Right. We. Um... We did notice that it was more among nonprofit and community sponsored and public organizations. And um, after we noticed that, we reached out to a couple people to ask, you know, what, what do you think is going on? Is it, is it maybe my sample is imbalanced? Maybe it's, this is something in the culture in the newsrooms? And so we spoke to, um, we spoke to Jim Schachter at WNYC. We spoke to Bill Keller and we um, spoke to a couple other people. And, um, you know, it seems like there is. Um, so it, you know, I say sort of built into the DNA, but as a public-facing um, organization where you're constantly asking the public to interact with you um, via membership or via, um, you know, giving information, calling into talk shows and stuff like that, um, Jim Schachter felt like that was really important. Um, part of the reason why they had been more open to collaboration sort of at the beginning. Um, and Bill Keller felt like it was, you know, a combination of sort of just resource constraints on the part of the smaller organizations, and, um, you know, sometimes they are the ones uh, initially to gain more, um, so they would be more open to it. Um, so, yeah, we did notice that. We noticed that trend, and we noticed that, um, but thankfully, you know, it seems to have become uh, very mainstream now as well for the larger organizations as well. Yeah. Part of that's probably also too because funding comes into play a lot, which we right. don't really get into. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which I did mention very briefly, funds so many of these collaborations at the beginning, or Knight Foundation or whomever, and they like to give money to nonprofits and community sponsors. Exactly. Right. So. Well, thank you yes. so much. Yes. For being here today, I yes. really appreciate it. Thank you. And um, if you don't already have the report, collaborativejournalism.org is where the full report will be, all of our tip sheets, and we will continue to collect case studies, research, um, and we'll launch a database, hopefully early next year. Mm -hmm. We're just starting to build that now with collaborative projects so that you can sort um, and we can categorize and, and help collect projects around the world that are happening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Again. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. And for anyone who wants a tour of the building, um, we'll meet right outside. Christine, will you be able to take folks? Oh, Christine, Christine will take Lemesiano. people on a tour if you'd like to take a spin around yeah, the building. She's assistant director of the School of Communication and Media here, so um, she'll give us a quick tour. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Thank so you. nice to meet you.